hear from one person from um, American Red Cross, one from the Memorial Blood Center. And then I thought I could have someone from the different regions speak. We have, um, uh, we have uh, in Duluth, we have both uh, Dan Williams with the Red Cross and Angela Engblom um, with Memorial Blood Centers. Uh, maybe you guys could tell us what's going on in the Northland. I actually saw a paper uh, from a small paper from up there saying that they were looking uh, for blood donators donations. And then um, I also we also have with us um, Kevin Muir, um, executive director um, with the Eastern North Dakota and Northwestern Minnesota chapter in Fargo. So it'd be good to hear what's going on up there. Um, and then we have Melanie uh, Cheetah, uh, executive director of the American Red Cross Southeast chapter in Rochester. So I thought it'd be good to gather people from different parts of the state. And then, and anyone who doesn't talk at the beginning, I'll ask you some questions. So you get the, the short end of the stick somehow. Um, so I um, want to again, thank everyone. It's wonderful that uh, all these experts came together. Um, and uh, before we dive in the conversation, I just wanna thank all of you for being on the front lines as you have and for your volunteers um, and for the medical professionals you work with every day. Um, we are seeing consequences of the pandemic everywhere we look, uh, including at our state's blood banks and hospitals rely on community no donations for uh, their blood supply. But right now, Minnesota's uh, blood bank donations are at a 10 year low um, compounding that, we're heading into a time of the year when blood donations tend to drop off anyway, right after the holidays where it's cold um, in our part of the country. And that's one of the reasons January is National Blood Donor Month, uh, because it's typically the time of year uh, when blood donations drop, despite needs still being high. I'm going to change this laptop a little so I can see you guys better. Sorry about this. There we are. Okay, there. Um, and it's a time when um, we see a change um, and a decrease. And so it's a good month to have, um, to have National Blood Donation Month. So what do we know? Well, we know that the American Red Cross of Minnesota and the Dakotas region report that donations are down 10% since the start of the pandemic. And the cold weather busy schedules, uh, the Omicron and what we've seen uh, recently in the last few months, uh, have made it harder to regain the supply that's been lost. And we all see, as the mayor of Duluth says, the lighthouse on the horizon, as we're seeing more and more data coming out uh, that while the Omicron is more contagious, it's also less lethal. Although we also know that people have no, who have not been vaccinated um, tend to get much more serious cases of it. So those are the facts, but all of that um, has led to uh, more need for donations and less people donating it. So the way to think about the shortage is that every two seconds, someone in the US is in need of blood or platelets, every two seconds. I had this happen when I had my hip replaced way back. I didn't think I was gonna need um, any uh, blood, but I couldn't get the, the numbers up and that was the only way for them to get me out of the hospital. So. Um, I know how important this can be. Uh, typically our hospitals have three to five days of blood available, if not more. Right now they are down to a one day supply. So that's why you see this cry across the state for more blood donations. And planning ahead for pre-scheduled surgeries and other procedures has truly helped our hospitals to get through this difficult, difficult time when we have a shortage of medical personnel for various reasons, including retirements, including uh, what I consider a problem is that we're not increasing the flow of um, people from other countries that can help out. And that's something else I think could be of great help in our hospitals. But right now, uh, what's happening is they have to plan ahead because we're down on staff. So it makes it even more important that they have the blood donation so they can plan ahead. And when medical emergencies strike, uh, we need to make sure they have the supply to respond to them. So the good news is that we can all help solve this problem by donating blood. One donation can save up to three lives, no matter what your blood type. Um, some centers are even providing uh, incentive. The Red Cross is holding a drawing for Super Bowl tickets. I'm sure everyone as last year will have to be vaccinated 
and offering gift cards. The Memorial Blood Centers is giving out rewards through a donor loyalty program. And so if people go to their website, which is redcrossblood.org and mbc.org for the Memorial Blood Centers, um, you can get your appointment. So that's what's happening. And um, I know people have questions um, and I will about how safe people can be, what are the precautions taken to give blood um, and the like, um, as we look at something we have to deal with on top of everything else. Uh, but I know in Minnesota, we're a hearty bunch with strong blood. Uh, and so we're up for helping. And so with that, I think I'll start with Tanya Teasley uh, with the American Red Cross of Minnesota and Dakotas. Tanya. Uh, thank you so much, Senator. So um, the American Red Cross actually supplies 40% of the nation's blood supply. And uh, I'm relatively new in this role. So that was something new that I learned uh, once I joined here. And as you mentioned, uh, oh, since the pandemic started, we uh, have experienced a 10% decline in the number of donors who've been donating blood um, out of concerns, uh, health concerns for themselves, et cetera. And we are now at a place um, where, as you mentioned, we are at the lowest point in our inventory that we've had in more than a decade. And um, we typically like to have that five-day supply in our inventory. And you mentioned that we're down to one day. There have been times in the past several weeks where we have been down to less than a one day supply in our blood inventory. So that's how critical it is. Uh, we need donors of all blood types, particularly type O blood, which is the ones that hospitals um, use the most. Uh, but we also need platelet donations, et cetera. And there are some patients who um, are requiring transfusions either um, for planned uh, elective surgeries or for other um, transfusion events who are not going to be able to get blood. And that's how critical this is. I know um, uh, in my own personal situation, a number of years ago, uh, when one of my children was born, he was in the neonatal intensive care unit for several months and had several procedures that required transfusions. And that was a situation that was so emotional and so stressful when there was blood available. And I cannot imagine what people are going through today when procedures like that have to be postponed uh, because of lack of blood supply available to them. Uh, so that's why I appreciate your taking the time, Senator, to um, bring awareness to the critical nature of this issue. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. I don't know, do you wanna add anything, David, as the board chair, where are you? Right. Yes, yes, Senator. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, yeah, I wear a couple hats. One is as board chair for the Twin Cities chapter, which I see firsthand how our staff and all our volunteers work hard to uh, make things happen, uh, ideally collecting blood, but I also see it on the hospital end. And as you spoke to, and as Tanya spoke to, we're having to prioritize surgery. That's something we haven't done in the past. In the United States, you know, obviously, we um, have a ample blood supply, but we have not had to prioritize surgeries before, and that's new. And with the pandemic and the way things are going, we don't know where the end of this is. So at several hospitals I work at, that's, that's very important. The other piece of it is, is there's per certain populations who need more blood than others. You spoke to the ones who are the accident victims and that. One of the things the Red Cross has prioritized this year is uh, sickle cell. And sickle cell, there's about 100,000 um, African-Americans, Black Americans who need blood at any given time. And that blood supply is going down as well. So we're actually making a push to certain populations to make sure we ah. get that blood in, in, the, in, the, in the work stream. But yeah, it's amazing how we're having to adapt and the things we're trying to do, um, we're, we're kind of doing it on the fly. We're finding out the best way to make new things happen. Appreciate okay. your interest in this. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you for your work. Um, and thanks for pointing out that we also have targeted needs as well. Nancy, uh, medical director at Memorial uh, Blood Centers, as well as Jed. I don't know which one of you wants to wants to go first here. Well, I, Jed, why don't you go ahead and take the lead on this because you've been very involved with this okay. for a long time now. All right, okay. Jed. Great, so I wear multiple hats. I'm the medical director of blood centers in Minnesota, uh, Lincoln and Omaha, Nebraska, Kansas City, 
but also the transfusion service director, along with Nancy, at both Hennepin and Minneapolis St. Paul Children's. But mm -hmm. in addition, I'm on the advisory committee for blood and tissue safety and availability. And the chair of that committee is Dr. Claudia Cohn, who also happens to be the chief medical officer of the American Association of Blood Banks. And, oh, by the way, one of our customers as transfusion service director at University of Minnesota. So I hope your uh, group will uh, talk with Claudia as well, uh, because she truly has a national uh, view as well as a uh, local view. Uh, I am honored to say that at least Memorial's direct customers are having a 99.5% uh, plus fill rate. Uh, so at least our customers are, are doing pretty well, proving the point that in Minnesota, our women are strong and good looking and blood donors are above average. That said, it, it is a national crisis and, and we do share with our sister blood centers in Rhode Island, New York, uh, <clears throat> Kansas City, uh, Nebraska, uh, where things are, are certainly uh, uh, more challenging. Basically, before COVID, half of our blood was collected at fixed sites and half was collected by going to schools, to churches, to businesses. During the height of COVID, you would go to congregate, you would go to congregate places and you those and we don't see as much of that right now. Yeah. Yeah. And so high school blood drives were canceled. They're just sort of restarting, but aren't quite back up to where they were. Uh, businesses with many businesses working, uh, people working from home, there's certainly just less people uh, there to collect from. Uh, and so uh, we've been highly dependent, whether it's the Red Cross or us, on fixed site donors, and we're starting to burn them out, frankly. Uh, mm -hmm. The FDA has been fantastically collaborative on trying to uh, uh, create some more evidence-based rules that, that have uh, diminished some deferrals, but frankly, it's, it's a, a, a modest uh, increment in the number of uh, eligible donors, but it's all appreciated. Uh, Peter Marx has done a fantastic job, but I would uh, highly suggest uh, paying attention uh, to the recommendations from the ACB TSA uh, that go to Rachel Levine, Assistant Secretary of Health, um, and those uh, which have been very collaborative, including the Red Cross representatives and, and uh, hospital and uh, blood center representatives. Uh, are doing things like increase national attention to blood donation. Uh, as uh, um, uh, David uh, mentioned, um, we have an increasingly diverse uh, country, but we're only slowly increasing uh, diversity in our donor base. Um, and it's been a, a real struggle and can certainly use governmental help uh, with, uh, with respect to that. And then hemovigilance programs, learning more uh, we don't really have the kind of national tracking uh, that other uh, nations do, both on uh, blood donation. Um, there is no simple way of knowing at any given time exactly how much blood is out there. Okay. Problem. All right. Um, Nancy, do you want to add well, something? Yeah. And I think that it, this has been an awareness for you know everyone as patients and it's people in healthcare. It's our industry where we're trying to collect enough blood. We're all working together to do the best we can because the bottom line is good patient care. There, you know, I can emphasize only what Jed has already shared. And also ethnic diversity. It's really important to have ethnic diversity among our blood donors, and we really don't have as much as we should right now. So I, I think that there are a lot of ways to try to tackle this, but it is hard for companies to um, allow, allow their employees, their donors to come in and donate if it's a fixed site versus you're able to have a drive at their site. It makes it much more challenging. So I think that's another aspect of it. And then overall having these staffing shortages that affect just not only healthcare, but also in our blood centers, you know, you have more people that may want to come in, but then you don't have the staffing to help with all the drives that may be needed. It's really, it really truly is a challenge because people are sick and there are shortages. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. One other thing to mention, and I don't know if Jed wants to elaborate on this a little bit more about the efforts we've had in the Twin Cities, working together with the, the blood centers here and the hospitals. Jed, do you want to hit on that a little bit? Yes, this has been a great example of Red Cross, Memorial, and hospitals working together under the leadership of the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, we've had uh, uh, scarcity preparedness plans actually starting with pandemic flu uh, a decade and a half or two ago, 
and I help write the uh, transfusion medicine preparedness plan. Uh, and we recently revised that in collaboration with uh, doctors from Health Partners, University of Minnesota, Red Cross and us. And I think it's a, a nice guide of basically things that both blood centers and uh, hospitals can do. Uh, so they're not, we're not all reinventing the wheel. Uh, and I can uh, send your colleagues the link to that uh, uh, site because I think it's uh, uh, useful. It, it's hardly Minnesota specific. Okay. Um, so it sounds like um, we have, and I, I'm going to, when we talk to some of the people around the state, I want to see what they're doing to kind of what some solutions are to get around this, because we have, um, we need more people to give uh, donate blood, which is our main message here today, correct? Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, we have the issues of staffing right now um, at some of the, at some of the centers. We need to do a better job of tracking the blood. Um, and we are going to just have to be um, and have in better preparedness plans, uh, which we have some in place, but but going going forward. So I just see this opportunity of getting the news out, which all of you have done extraordinarily well, actually. I think a lot of us are starting to hear about this in the news. Um, the more you get the news out, and we've got many members of the media on this call, um, the more people find out about it and then they're willing to go in and donate. So maybe we'll start um, We'll start in Rochester um, with Melanie Cheetah, who's the executive director of the American Red Cross uh, for the Southeast chapter in Rochester. What's going on uh, down there where you have a lot of doctors and nurses <laughs> and health we, needs? So. We have a pretty strong health community. Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, and the Red Cross has had a long partnership with the Mayo Clinic um, and we've actually recently kind of taken that to a new place um, until very recently, the Mayo Clinic did all the collection in Olmstead County and the Red Cross did all the collection in all the surrounding counties. And this uh, blood supply being so low uh, caused us to have some additional conversations with our colleagues at Mayo Clinic. And we recently held a drive here at our building, the Red Cross building here in Rochester, with a real strong emphasis on recruiting new donors who aren't currently giving. Perhaps they're not working in their office downtown, they're working from home, or perhaps they used to give um, at their workplace and uh, those opportunities haven't been available recently. Uh, we filled up all the appointments right away, which was pretty exciting. And in visiting with many of the donors who came they said, well, this is a convenient time and place and that makes it easy to give. And I think that was an important lesson for us to hear from these donors in that um, sometimes we do have to think outside the box and uh, maybe find a new location, find new times, find uh, some way to capture their attention because then we were able to get people to come in the door. And, well, and are you able to, and I know Mayo is one glaring a good example, but are there other companies that used to have the blood drives inside where you can partner with them to have their people come somewhere, even though they're Absolutely. not as yep. convenient. Yeah. That is something that we're going to be talking with our male colleagues about uh, how to complement each other with those services being available. They had previously before COVID had done some drives at the colleges and um, at the high schools. So we certainly don't want to, um, compete or step on any toes. We just wanna make those opportunities available for people who are looking for that. We did have an, uh, a couple of our board members uh, really strongly promoted the this drive to the extent that they gave their employees time off to come and donate and that helped our response. So we had people came who said, well, I was able to take the two hours off in order to you know, come and, and donate today. And, and that was the support of the employer making that right. happen. I'm just trying to think of converting that employer help that's always been so strong in, from other employers into um, trying to steer people um, to the blood banks. Maybe we should go uh, up uh, north where it's really cold. And of course we need two people on to represent the Northland. <laughs> They are, they're always well represented. And now we have, uh, why don't we go over to Angela with Northland Component Services for Memorial Blood Centers in Duluth. And then we'll hear from uh, Dan Williams um, with the American Red Cross for the Northern chapter. When you wanna start, Angela? Sure, yes, my name is Angela Ingloom. I'm the Senior Manager for the Duluth Operations. So the whole Duluth um, Memorial Blood Center site that's here. 
We have serviced 18 hospitals as well as three medical transport companies out of um, this facility. And so we have, it's, it has honestly been a challenge. I've been here for over 24 years. I've been employed here and this is like the longest, most heart-wrenching, you know, difficulty we've ever faced, um, you know, as far as, you know, continued blood storage. This is, this is just going, it's been going on and on and on to the point where I don't know if it's actually ever going to end. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I have a lot of years here. So this has been, you know, kind of been eye-opening. And, you know, a lot of this is pandemic related. Um, so we have been trying to be creative. We've worked with our hospitals. We've asked our hospitals across all of IDR to reduce their inventory by 20%. I at least am happy to say that I feel like our hospitals have all gotten the blood that they truly need to really, you know, minimize any kind of impact to patient care. Um, But it has been really a big challenge. We have moved blood around. We've, you know, had to, like I said, we've reduced inventory at the hospital. So they're not as comfortable with what they have because, you know, a lot of our hospitals are a couple hours away from us. And so they're nervous when they don't have as much blood on their shelf as what they typically have. Um, we are 24 seven operations up here, which helps us be able to get products to them as, as they need them. Um, we have worked with the community members, you know, we're in the same boat as um, Red Cross has talked about as far as not being able to get into the businesses to draw blood because you no know, people are working from home, um, schools have been closed, you know, all the hybrid learning stuff. It's, it's been a really big challenge. We're having the staffing shortages that everybody else is having. Um, we did have some luck with having some donor days like um, they're talking about in Rochester and encouraging our um, normal businesses we, that we do blood drives with and the schools we do blood drives with to host a day where they can come in and um, donate blood at our donor centers as well. So it has been a truly, you know, ongoing, ongoing challenge. I do think our hospitals have had to do some modifications um, slight modifications because their inventory levels and having to make sure that they're comfortable. We're not ask, currently not asking them to do any kind of um, cancellation or reduction of elective surgeries. We have in the past and during the pandemic, we're not currently in that state right now though, which is good, but it's still, it's still a you know, significant ongoing shortage of blood products for us. Okay, yes. And it would be, I can imagine even some of these smaller hospitals and um, getting the blood there, it just takes in all of our rural areas. Um, yeah, and we, and we go, I mean, the hospital- I bet service. some of your donors are older than in some of the other places. So the pandemic has been an issue. It has been. And that's one of the issues too, is that some of the donors are aging out and we're needing to get new donors and more, like we're talking before about more, you know, more diverse population of donors as well. So that definitely has had a big impact. Okay, thank you. Dan? I'll add in uh, you know, a lot of the same things that were added from Memorial. Uh, we, we happen to be uh, located, uh, I'm literally sitting uh, about uh, what uh, 300 yards from uh, Angela across, uh, across Maple Grove Road here in Hermantown. You know, one of the things that it reminds me of is the fact that, you know, as other people have said, it's really about getting people to donate for the first time. As people age out of being blood donors, it's about encouraging new people to become donors. And so one of the things I love about uh, the Northland up here is some of the partners that actually help support both uh, drives with the Red Cross and drives with Memorial. So I'm thinking of places like Bent Paddle Brewing or uh, or other organizations like that, some of the colleges in the area. Um and if you think of our, the Northern Minnesota chapter, you know, covers all the way from, uh, if you picture um, uh, Senator, all the way from like Wadena and Brainerd, all the way up to the Canadian border. And that, that sort of core of that area from uh, Wadena up through Brainerd and up to Aiken County, really huge, generous donate, uh, don't blood donors in that um, part of the state. Um, and up in our area, in the Duluth area here, um, some really, you know, creative partnerships. You know, you talked about how we can engage some of these companies in ways that um, we maybe had in the past, but it doesn't work that any way anymore because they're maybe not at work or they're not at school. So thinking of places like the Duluth Entertainment Convention Center, you know, which is a, a public facility who's been fantastic partners with us in uh, giving us large spaces that have lots of airflow and lots of uh, sort of separation space. Um, to do blood drives there in partnership with places like Affinity Plus Credit Union or Bentleyville or others. And so um, a lot of this is, you know, how do we engage some of those partners uh, in ways that are new um, that takes into consideration the reservations that people people have. Giving, I went to Bentleyville this year. People weren't giving blood right there outside. 
Nope, nope, not Explore giving her segment. Okay, good. Yeah. So uh, they were helping us promote blood drives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were help uh, uh, promoting the blood drives in advance. Uh, they actually printed up some T-shirts that were sort of Bentleyville uh, uh, festive branded around it to to encourage people to donate. And again, to to make sure people feel appreciated, the people that are uh, sticking this out and donating blood are new blood donors that are coming and and in hearing this message. And are thinking to themselves, well, I could make a difference this way. I know my parents or I know my uncle or my aunt or my teacher talked about donating blood. Maybe I can do that same thing myself. Uh, that's what we're trying to encourage is, as new people to think about becoming blood donors too. Okay, very good. All right, thanks. Well, and then uh, last but not least, Kevin Mayer from uh, Fargo, which of course I like to call it Moorhead Fargo. But, <laughs> uh, a Fargo Moorhead, but thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. You know, uh, Senator Klobuchar, you pointed out every blood donor uh, can save up the up to three lives uh, with uh, one donation. And I just want to point out that every donor really does matter. Um, and so uh, out in Ottertail County, which where we uh, where, where I serve, we have seven blood drives coming up in the next two months. And that's uh, that's a lot of blood drives for one county to have. And so we encourage everyone to come out and uh, also encourage you that if you've ever been deferred for any reason that, uh, that, you know, try again, make an appointment. Um, or if you know that you cannot donate uh, through the Red Cross, you also can volunteer. I just recently heard a story of a phlebotomist that had to greet our donors. And this is someone that could be taking out a, another donation of blood, uh, but was, uh, but instead was having to greet our donors. And so uh, if you can't donate, or you still want to participate, you can you can volunteer at our blood drives as well. So, um, so we're looking forward to uh, you know growing that uh, base as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. very good. And I know Wendy, you're on as well uh, with the uh, with Memorial Blood Center. So thank you for being on. Are you there, Wendy? Yes, I am. Thank you very much, Senator. We really appreciate you bringing awareness to this important issue. Um, what I'm hearing everyone say is that in order to have, have a healthy community, we need a healthy blood supply. And so mm -hmm. we really appreciate you helping us get the word out. And I think that's part of our challenge is people think that if we're not on the news telling you we need blood, that we don't need it. But we do. We need blood donors every day. And that's the reality because it's the people who donate today that make sure we're prepared for tomorrow's emergency. So I think Jed mentioned um, organizations, employers that used to years ago give employees time off to donate. There are some organizations now that give volunteer hours to their employees. And if you could help us get the word out that blood donation is a really important volunteer activity, it's a unique way you can contribute to the health of the community. So we would greatly appreciate any opportunity to create a PSA or some kind of a regular appeal to help get that word out on a routine basis. Exactly. And I think a lot of that is getting, encouraging people to ask their employers if they could get that time off. Um, and especially or with maybe, people working at home while it's, as we talked about, it's harder because they're not there. I still right. have stories of when I was at the law firm, like when someone else next door giving blood, that, you know, from a different department, it was always quite amusing. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, some of that is still going on and will start going on again, as you know, but for now, they'll just encourage them to go places. Um, right. May I just about, say one? Go ahead. One, go, go ahead. Sorry. We have a really important blood drive tomorrow with the Minnesota Timberwolves at Target Center from 10 uh, to 5. So we would love to have people go out. And if organizations or employers can donate space, like large spaces, like the deck that Dan was talking about, that really makes it easier for us to get out there to the community if they donate that space for us to have a blood drive. We need at least 1,800 square feet, and that would help us tremendously to be able to um, have a common location for people to meet, like you said, places where people congregate, but it needs to be socially distanced and safe. Right. So let's get to that if anyone wants, wants to talk about um, how it is safe uh, right now in uh, to donate blood and what kind of precautions. It, I don't care, maybe one from either uh, Memorial Blood Center and Red Cross, one of each, uh, just whoever's the best person to address that. What are some of the things you do to make people realize that they can do this and be safe? So Senator Dave Hamler, sorry for 
it's okay. Uh, nothing is uh, memorial. Um, at the same time, you know, we've always had safeguards in place. We've always been aseptic in our technique and how we draw the blood, but now we have to distance and we have to make sure people are either vaccinated, and I think that's going to be the commonplace everywhere, or at least have the um, documentation that they have been vaccinated. One of the things is the fear is, is that obviously there's a contamination part portion of it. The contamination, I think, is probably 0% in either of our, our two uh, spaces. The other thing, can you contract um, um, any uh, disease, specifically COVID, from donating blood? No, you can't. That's been proven that that's not, that's a non-issue. Uh, everyone is screened. We do a wonderful screening process, not only online, pre-visit, but also when you enter the facility. And then because of the um, efforts of the staff and the volunteers, we keep the socially distanced, we make sure people are staying away. And then when they collect the blood, the blood is done in a safe way, a safe manner. And then it's screened. Now, in some of the issues that we talked about targeted populations, we screen blood not only for the regular blood types, but we screen it for certain types of antigens that might sit on it because we have a chronic disease population out there who receives blood all the time. People have lymphoma, leukemia, and they have to have special processes where they make sure the blood is the correct uh, type even down to the antigenicity that means, you know, certain little blebs that are on the end of the cell. So those folks have special care taken in, ter in terms of looking for their blood and what's going on. So I would and say it's a very- Type O negative, I just, type O negative is the most needed blood group because it, right? Because it can be- you, you are the, yeah, you're the most, um, you're the one who can donate to everyone. So yes, you can give to everyone. Yeah, and typo positives also in high demand. So is there a way for people to know that they're in that group? I mean, I guess they have to find out from their doctor. And yeah, well, usually if you give blood, that's the quickest way to find okay. out how okay. much your blood oh, can, is. Okay, <laughs> we let you know on the spot. But right. yeah, there are other methods through the Department of Health and everyone else. Yeah. And, and but the point is, is that we will let you know your type. And once you register with either Red Cross or Memorial. We, we make sure we send special messages to you for your particular type as well. So those are things that are beneficial. Again, we have done things in spaces uh, just like everyone else in the large venues to stay safe so that you have that 1800 feet. And now you can go to churches and YMCAs, the Excel Center where we had one. So those are all venues that we can take advantage of. There's some things that we can do to try and make sure that we get more blood in the system and that's going to those areas just like I talked to you before and that was mentioned before that we normally don't go to. In other words, we need to extend our aperture, open our aperture so that we're looking for diverse types of blood where we haven't really gone. So that will help us send that message out as well. But in terms of the question you asked initially, blood collection is very safe. The donation process is um, well patterned and we know exactly how we've done it in the past. And we're taking mm -hmm. extra precautions because of COVID, because of the uh, mandates that are out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Someone else want to chime in on this about the safety issues? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. I, I know all the the great work you you pointed out um, on the on the other end when the blood's checked. But I think one of the reasons we know that there's been some slowdown, right, is because of the pandemic, um, and it's on the end of don donating blood and just. Um, just any thoughts on that and, and what more sure. we can do? This is Jed. I will chime in. Memorial, like the Red Cross, has certainly made great efforts for donors to feel safe. Uh, we have mandated vaccinations for all employees. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, distancing, uh, 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 both physical distancing, and we've asked that donors make appointments. Uh, we used to depend more on just drop-ins um, and both for <laughs> assuring the, uh, the supply uh, but also assuring that we can maintain that physical distancing we've uh, requested uh, uh, donors to schedule. Uh, mm -hmm. We are incredibly fortunate that this is not a transfusion transmittable illness. There basically is no prolonged viremic phase. And I am chair of the American Association of Blood Banks uh, 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 mm -hmm. Transfusion Transmitted Disease Committee. Um, and <clears throat> uh, it has certainly greatly simplified things that at least the one thing we don't have to worry about is uh, 
uh, any cases of trans of acquisition of COVID by uh, transfusion. Uh, but you know that that that's sort of lucky, uh, and who knows what the next pandemic is. So in our pandemic preparedness uh, planning for the future, we certainly need to address possibilities of what if the next icky thing that is out there turns out to be transfusion transmissible. I think that's worth uh, uh, discussion and certainly has uh, uh, been brought to the attention of the ACB TSA and we have recommendations. Okay, but right now it's not, the, the variants that we have are not. There, but for the grace of God went we and we got lucky. This is Angela from Memorial Blood Centers in Duluth. I also want to point out that um, we're requiring masking. You know, we all of our all of our as well as requiring the vaccination for all of our employees. Um, we have a lot of vaccination requirement from our hospitals as well. Um, that actually, um, I think all but three of our Northland hospitals we service are actually requiring um, vaccination for our staff to be able to go into their facilities. So we kind of were in line with that. Um, we are we are requiring masking. Um, if a if a donor comes in, they don't have a mask. We have one to give them. All of our staff are always being masked. Uh, we do a lot of decontamination of the surface area. Basically, as a donor comes in, we've always been aseptic. Like I think it was um, something said before. We've always been aseptic. We've always been very you know clear and clean as far as how we do our needle sticks and such. Um, but we do a lot of additional um, surface decontamination as well. And then we do try to maintain the social distancing. We have um, the buses, we try to stagger the buses, um, our drives out longer so that we have less congestion in the buses and try to, so we can have more of that physical distancing of space. And then of course, when we have like our inside set up, that's what we'd like the larger square footage because it gives the ability to have more of a physical separation as well. Mm -hmm. so we're doing everything we can as far as disinfecting and masking and following all the you know safety protocols. Yeah, just Nancy, and you can think about it. I mean, it's actually a much safer place to come into a blood donor center than it is to go anywhere else publicly. <laughs> it's with all the precautions that are in place and people that are there, they're all healthy. Exactly. And I mean, it's it's a lot safer than any place you could choose to go, whether it's a restaurant or store or whatever else. So. Mm -hmm. It's funny, it's completely true, but I think sometimes people, you know, they don't think like that because it's in, it's in a, a medical setting. So, and so as you look to, you know, incentives for this younger donor base that you need to recruit for both uh, reasons to get at ethnicity and um, this um, incredible, incredibly expanding population in Minnesota, which is really exciting of our immigrant community, people of color, that's part of it. But it's also just in general, you need younger donors, as you point, as someone pointed out, as I think um, in some of the rural areas, especially as um, people are aging out, they're not going to, um, they get older and they're not in that kind of, some of the younger people actually are very, as I point out at every college graduation I speak at, they're very community minded, right? They think about the world around us and it would seem uh, like this would actually be a good uh, target group. Um, and so tell me, maybe we'll, we can end here as we look to the future, just what are some of the techniques you use to get at uh, both a more diverse donor group, but also a younger donor group, and they're, they're kind of combined in some ways. So yeah, maybe chime in, uh, Senator. One of, the, one of the great things about when the pandemic started was, uh, you know, some people have pointed out the need for volunteers, how it, it sort of expands, it leverages our staff members to be able to collect blood more efficiently. And the University Medical School, University of Minnesota Medical School Duluth campus had a fantastic group of students who were very close to graduating from medical school um, who volunteered for that first, you know, the, the March, April, May, June of 2020 when things were sort of at their worst and people were scared about uh, doing things and there was this really critical need. Um, it was fantastic to see these um, blossoming medical professionals who will be the, the the, the doctors that uh, serve our communities across the state, uh, volunteering at blood drives at a time when it was really hard to get volunteers to do that. So um, I think how, uh, you know, when you think of colleges around the, the state that have been able to stay together, you know, that have been, been um, in school for, for learning, um, really great engagement of the communities uh, in those campuses where high schools have gotten back together. You know, I think of Wadena High School and others that have uh, really just been continuing fantastic blood donor uh, groups. Um, I just, we need to keep doing more of that and, and encouraging that to happen. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. Uh, Senator, uh, Red Cross has a, I, I call it an ambassador program, where we actually, obviously the schools have been down and we haven't been able to get the participation in the past, but we engage our youth in our schools with an amb ambassador program. And Tanya or, or Melanie can speak to it, where we're engaging the youth and there's clubs, so to speak, and they put on blood drives. And obviously it's, it's a little bit down now, but we hope to re-engage and re-energize those groups in those schools. The same mm -hmm. thing happens in churches. When we have blood drives, we solicit the actual personnel who are at those facilities to engage with us. And they become ambassadors in those communities where we go. So we're recruiting to recruit. And uh, it's, it's, multiplier. it's a multiplier that helps us in that regard. Tanya or M Melanie, do you want to speak to what, we're, what we've done in the past with youth? That's a great example, Dr. Hamler, of the ways that we try to um, encourage youth to be the leaders and not just follow our lead, but lead um, other youth. And, and one of the messages we've heard from our uh, Red Cross Club members is that the world is a lot smaller to them than, than it is to us. And when something like a natural disaster happens, like a, a tornado that goes through Kentucky in December, they realize right away that that means nobody's collecting blood. They're responding to that tornado and the needs of, for the blood supply are going to continue. So a volunteer from Minnesota who, who might say, well, I can't, I can't go to Kentucky. I don't have the time in my schedule. What else can I do to help? Ironically, it's the blood donors who step right up and say, well, I can donate blood. And that will help replenish the, the, the donations that are either being sent to those hospitals for the people who are affected by that disaster or, or will replace the donor donations that aren't being collected because that community needs to just respond to the disaster itself before they can resume their regular collection. Oh, you would see, so. yeah, I think the argument is that some of the younger donors are pretty plugged in yes. uh, to seeing themselves as part of what happens in other parts of our country, or actually our world. Yes. And so when those moments happen, um, exactly. whether it's through social media or the like, it's a way to uh, engage, which I've certainly seen in uh, politics as well. Absolutely. It's a way to bring people in, in a way that um, maybe wouldn't have happened 25 years ago. Absolutely. And the, the Red Cross has this blood donor app that tells you where your blood donation ended up. So 40% oh, cool. of the nation's blood collected by the Red Cross. So my last blood donation went to a hospital in Illinois. And isn't that exciting for me as a blood donor to know that I can help anywhere in the country where that blood is needed, it's going to go. And that for our younger donors, that resonates with them. That resonates. Mm -hmm. Very and good. Disaster response is very important. And I certainly applaud the Red Cross's role in doing an amazing job of disaster response but we need to be very, very careful that that is not the message for blood donation. Mm -hmm. The amount of blood used every day is actually incredibly consistent and tornadoes and hurricanes and other mayhem shoot, mass shootings, uh, all they, though they are very newsworthy, actually have very minimal increment in the amount of blood usage. Uh, and so what we, the message to get across from a blood standpoint is that it's needed constantly. Uh, whoever thought of putting Christmas and New Year's a week apart, a pox on you. Um, it is very challenging to have blood donation around holidays uh, because you know no, nobody wants to come in at Christmas or uh, have blood drives between Christmas and, uh, and New Year's. But the point is, is blood usage is pretty consistent and hence blood donation needs to be consistent. Mm -hmm. and what we don't want to do is get the message of only donate after disasters uh, because then we're crying wolf. And, uh, we I think what, I think what uh, we're talking about is just getting some new donors and young donors involved and interested. And it, then, of course, the idea is to convert it into something else. Um, we certainly see this with things like gun violence, where we know the everyday violence um, is the highest cost of human life. But more and more people get um, motivated and get passionate about something because of what they've seen. And this is really true of young people. It, it is, they, they see something and they want to help. And so it's just, I think what, what 
uh, Melanie was talking about was just simply a way to bring people in. And there is some need for blood for these disasters. And they have a they have a decrease in donations at that time in areas that are disaster struck that can affect them for um, months, I'm sure. So, so I'm also on the trauma committee at Hennepin, where we have had more penetrating trauma, gunshot wounds and knife Mm -hmm. wounds as of end of August than we did in all of 2019. So sadly, this is not just a problem of decreased donations. This is also increased usage. Uh, people are driving in less respectful ways, shall we say. Uh, and so there's more blood being used uh, for take care of car accidents. So this is a combination of both increased usage and uh, uh, challenges on donation collection. Okay. Very good. Um, Maybe we want to end. I see Wendy had her hand up and then but Wendy. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, you asked about young donors and what we're doing differently and, and not necessarily what we're doing differently, but our tradition has been to encourage uh, students to become leaders for tomorrow. So we have a high school scholarship program where we um, encourage students to participate in a blood drive, either as a volunteer or as a volunteer blood donor, and they can earn points for their school to receive a high school scholarship for a student selected by the faculty. We also hold a high school workshop every year to try to help those student leaders develop leadership skills and um, learn about how to use social media for the, a general cause like blood donation. And we need to meet the young donors where they are. And uh, traditionally about 30% of blood that we collect during the school year comes from high school students. But school is not in session in the sense that it was before or campuses are closed. And so that's really impacting not only our ability to have enough blood, but also their ability to earn those scholarship dollars and get those leadership skills. So we want to try to re-engage some of those items. We're being, um, uh, we're on social media more, but we need more help. And so um, again, we would love to have uh, more support for building awareness about the need for blood to keep our community safe. Very good. Uh, you know, as we were concluding here, I was thinking how at this moment in our history where people be, through no fault of their own with the pandemic uh, feel less connected and they want to be more connected and they're finding ways um, to do that. And where you have uh, people at odds politically, and I'm not telling you a secret you didn't know. Um, it seems like this is one volunteer activity uh, that can uh, bring people together, uh, regardless of where they are politically, regardless of where they live, which is why we thought it was important to have people from different parts of the state on. Um, and you don't know where your blood's going to end up. Um, and um, But you're doing it because you believe in a cause larger than yourself. So I just want to thank you for your work. And we hope we can get the word out and be as creative as possible. Uh, to try to get the word out to get more donors and more consistent donors um, so they keep coming and also that it's safe to give blood. I, I really like that analogy because I was just like, you know, everyone on, out there thinking, well, is this a safe time to do this? But actually people are going to a lot of places that are less safe and, you know, accepting that grocery stores, restaurants, because they have to. And it's actually quite safe to go in a place where uh, people have been vaccinated and there's rules in place um, and uh, and the like, and less people, I'm sure, in a lot of the places. So I just want to thank you and ask everyone to go to the websites of these two major uh, organizations to uh, 